Hey everyone, welcome to Talks at Google. I'm Matt Bonjovi, and I am delighted and honored to be joined today by Pixar co-founder, Dr. Albie Ray Smith. Dr. Smith is a computer graphics pioneer with an impressive range of accomplishments. He was the first director of computer graphics at Lucasfilm and the first graphics fellow at Microsoft. He's also received two Technical Academy Awards for his contribution to digital movie making technology. Dr. Smith is here with us today to discuss his new book, A Biography of the Pixel, which examines this foundational technology, the Pixel, from multiple angles, art, technology, entertainment, business, and history. Dr. Smith's story of the Pixel's development begins with Fourier waves, proceeds through Turing machines, and ends with the first digital movies from Pixar, DreamWorks, and Blue Sky. Throughout his telling, Dr. Smith deftly captures the complexities and interwoven narratives that make up the muddled and messy history of technological development, delivering a story that is compelling, nuanced, and approachable for anyone, regardless of whether you have a background in technology. Now, throughout our talk, you might have some great questions popping into your head, and when you do, please go ahead and add them to the chat on the right. We will have time shortly for Dr. Smith to answer some of your questions, so be sure to get them in early. But first, Dr. Smith, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, indeed. <clears throat> your book very early on makes a clarification about the definition of a pixel, what it is and what it isn't. Can you explain to us what you mean by this term pixel? Well, that's that's the question, isn't it? In fact, I spent the last 10 years writing this book just to explain what pixels were because I realized nobody seemed to know, which is kind of weird because uh, I have several billion pixels right here on my little device. Right. You do too. So does everybody else. We're a swim and, oh, I think I estimate a zettapixel, an ocean of zettapixels. Right. That's a one with 21 zeros after it. What are these things? And I ask people and I get these really cockamamie answers. Nobody really knows. The one thing they definitely are not are little abutting squares. Right. That's just one of the, that's, that's, a, that's a misperception that has been allowed to go on for way too long. So I thought I would try to stop that one call right now. It never right. was true. Right. So what is a pixel? A pixel is a sample, according to the sampling theorem, at a particular frequency, which represents a picture. So right. if you think of the picture as a signal, a two-dimensional signal, and if you sample at a certain rate, which is well defined by the sampling theorem, then you can throw away the infinity of, of points in the signal right. and only maintain the samples, which we call pixels. Right. It's a mind blower of a theorem. It basically says you can throw away an infinity and not lose your picture. What? Yeah. How does that work? Yeah. Yeah. And can we get into the sampling theorem a little bit? Because I think some of the engineers in the audience might have some familiarity with this, but they're maybe thinking, oh, isn't that one of that thing that Claude Shannon came up with? Um, can you tell us yeah. a bit about it? Well, I thought it was Claude Shannon. You know, <laughs> I grew up, uh, I was educated as an electrical engineer before computer science. Right. And we were taught actually uh, that, that uh, Nyquist proved right. the theorem first. Well, he proved the sampling theorem, but not the one we use. Okay. And uh, then we were taught that Claude Shannon did it. So, of course, when I started to write that part of the book, I went to research Shannon. And you know what? He never even claimed he wrote it. He proved right. it. He wasn't the first. Right. He just sort of waved his hands and said, well, it's kind of out there in the air. And everybody seems to know about it. Here are the details. But since he was a, you know, a valid source, people have parroted his, uh, his proof. Ever since, it just sort of took on his name. He never claimed it. Right. I claimed that the guy who proved it was Vladimir Kotelnikov, a Russian communist who'd proved it in 1933. And it's all in the book. He's an amazing character, amazing character. And I think one of the reasons we don't know about him in America is because he was a communist. And we couldn't give credit for something so important to a commie, could we? Right. And so, so what did he realize about, um, about waves, specifically ones that represent a visual scene? Well, okay, so this is the, like I said, the, um, the uh, sampling theorem is a mind blower. Okay. He, Kotelnikov says, if you sample at regular intervals, 
in two dimensions, a picture, a picture signal. And I'll tell you what frequency you have to sample at to make this true. Then you can throw away everything but the samples and not lose any, any information. In other words, you can reconstruct the, the uh, signal, the picture, 10 years later or on the other side of the earth, and you right. can do it perfectly. It's not an approximation. You, you can actually get the original signal back. It's, it's an astonishing theorem. You just have to trust the math. And um, what is that magic frequency that you have to sample at? Right. Well, Fourier told us that, I haven't really talked about Fourier, but Fourier uh, told us that, I, I, the way I put it is, it's all music. We know that uh, music is a sum of, of regular waves of different frequencies and different amplitudes. Well, so are pictures. And Fourier, Fourier's theory says, oh, yeah, it works for two-dimensional signals as well. The, the regular waves look like corrugations rather than sine waves. But they have a sine wave as a cross-section. Right. Fourier says you can add together these Fourier waves, two-dimensional Fourier waves, to get any picture, like the ones we're looking at on television right now, or of your uh, of your child, or of the Milky Way, you know, anything. It's a sum of waves. No matter how erratic the picture, how irregular the picture looks, is a sum of regular waves. That was a mind blower in seventeen eight, about eighteen hundred, let's say. Yeah. And but Fourier finally got the world to accept it, and most probably everybody listening today uses Fourier on a daily basis. It's just He's one of our guys. Right. <laughs> Not very well understood guy, by the way. So I spent a chapter on him. Yeah. Um, the, he almost got his head cut off. I don't think think most people know that. Yeah. Um, yeah his whole history with Napoleon and and the Rosetta Stone. Yeah. Going to, he has so many tangents yeah. in his life that are remarkable. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, the greenhouse effect. He right. gave us the greenhouse effect. This is about 1800. Yeah. It's been around for hundreds of years. That was Fourier. Yeah. Okay, so what Kotelnikov said was, if you take the highest frequency, you take the wave of highest frequency in the sum that adds up to being a picture, right, and sample it twice that frequency, right, then you can throw away everything but the samples, right, and frankly. The whole modern media world is based on that mind blower. Zoom is based on that. In yeah. fact, well, like I pointed out in my book probably too many times, nearly all pictures that ever existed are now digital. Right. You have to go to museums or uh, kindergartens is my joke to find the old <laughs> analog variety, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, so, so what you're saying is basically Fourier reala realized that all visual scenes can be constructed out of this sum of, of essentially sine waves. And, yeah, regular waves. Mm -hmm. And once we have that, we can examine that scene and say, okay, what's the highest frequency? We'll sample it twice that. That was Kotelnikov. Right. And he said, if we take those infinitely small samples, we can then later reconstruct the infinity of, uh, of waves that existed just from those specific samples. Okay, now several things I'd like to point, that's exactly right, Matt. See, what I wanna point out for, about what you just said was, yeah. a sample is a value of the signal, the original signal, the original picture, right. at a point. Right. You can't see a point. Right. You can't see a pixel. Right. So there's one major misconception right there. You can't see pixels. Right. They're samples at a point. With a color attached, say. Right. Um, so how do we see? What are we looking at right now? Yeah. Well, every display device, I'll hold up my cell phone, yeah. has little glowy, has an array of little glowy, I call them display elements. They are not pixels. They are right. little glowy analog blobs of right. light. And they, I, I say that, that the, the expression I use is the pixels underneath, the things you can't see, yeah. are spread by these little blobs of light right. and added up to reconstruct according to the sampling theorem. Right. 
the original picture. So you're not carrying around pictures in here. You're carrying around pixels, samples of the pictures. And only when you say, show me that picture, does the really fast computers that are in these things right now say, okay, here it is. Yeah. And it applies the sampling theorem reconstruction, the, the, the part of the sampling theorem that says, here's how you get the picture back. Right. 10 years later on the other side of the planet, different from yeah. a different planet even, yeah. uh, that you've been carrying around all this time. And yeah. it's a perfect reconstruction to within uh, right. some, 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 some points that I can bring up if, you, if people really want to get down into the weeds. Yeah. Well, this kind of gets at one of the recurring themes of your book, which is this dichotomy between the ideal theory and then the reality or the, the implementation. How do you characterize those differences and how have you seen it show up in uh, the creation of new technology? Um, I guess what we're talking about is science versus engineering, perhaps. I mean, there's a, right. some point where you have this beautiful. So what Katelnikov says, what, what you, in order to spread a pixel in and so you can see it again. You spread it with a shape we call sink, a sink in, ma in mathematics. Yeah. It kind of, it's a hump, and then it ripples off to infinity in both directions. Right. Well, that rippling off to infinity in both directions bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We can't deal with that in the real world. We have to have things of finite width. Yeah. And engineers so we, not thrilled about an infinitely long. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you just can't. You can't do anything. So we yeah. we 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 use an, a a very good approximation, but a finite width of the right. ideal. So, but it, as you can see, it works really well. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And we see this kind of uh, reality or theory versus reality in the history of movies that you discuss in your book as well, especially when we look at how movies are created and how the sampling process is different from what we've been discussing so far with the sampling theorem. Can you tell us how the early pioneers of cinema were approaching the idea of sampling the world? <laughs> completely naively they had no idea they right. had no idea what they were doing it's yeah. amazing that they stumbled on anything at all <laughs> um when you look at what movies act so in my book i actually explained to you what a sampling theory based movie system yes could be and i'm kind yeah. of surprised that nobody's ever built one yeah uh we can talk about that if you want so what what movies do instead of uh, recon so the name of the sample in in time is a frame, right? One frame after another, right? So it looks like if we if we spread the frames and added them all up according to the sampling theorem, we could get the original visual flow represented by the move by the movie frames reconstructed and presented to our brains. And I think that's kind of what's going on, but nobody, nobody, <laughs> nobody actually understands it that way. We sort of get bogged down, and once we get inside the pupil, and right. uh, the brain takes over, all of a sudden, we go, mm, well, probably it works like this, but who knows, right? Yeah. Um, in animation, in particular, things get weird. You know, yeah. in animation, well, let's let's just start with regular movies. Regular movies show each frame twice right bam 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 well that's not sampling theory right <laughs> and somehow our brains make sense out of seeing a frame twice and in the case of animations sometimes each frame is shown four times animators right. used to save um, a lot of time by shooting on twos they called it right so they would just do every other frame 12 frames per second. That means when you looked at a frame, it hit your retina four times. Right. And our brains have figured out what to do with that, which is sort of a marvel in itself. So um, yeah. the big the big idea, and the so the movies all basically began in 1895. It's a really cool, there's a nice clean year, 1895, right. when the guys who made the movies who aren't the ones people usually think right um figured out how to 
basically make a projector, a camera and a projector. And they had this new thing called film. Right. And uh, somehow they jerry rigged those three things together and it works sort of. I mean, yeah. you know, it doesn't. It flickered in the old days. Right. And there were all sorts of artifacts that are still preserved in today's modern simu digital simulations. Yeah. But I think the sampling theorem gives us a way of talking about movies and how they work or might work or sh should work. Yeah. Yeah. Because in the book, you mentioned that they early movie makers just kind of by feel decided what this sampling rate should be. And then, as you mentioned, they kind of fudged some things where they'd show a frame twice so that you could save on the amount of film that you're using. And... Oh, the amount of film was a biggie, right? Yeah. And so there's this basic idea that you've got to refresh the human retina about 50 times per second. Right. Somewhere in that vicinity. In a darkened theater, you might get away with a smaller number, like 48 times a second. Right. So how do you do that when you, you know, in the case of, so they, for, for various reasons, they just, they just decided on 24 frames per second yeah. fairly rapidly. Yeah. But 24 frames per second, it's not fast enough to take care of this refresh rate requirement of the human, human right. eye. Right. So they just showed each frame twice. Okay. Yeah. The, and the, the reason they didn't go with 48 was because that used twice as much film, and that was just an economic right. stopper. Yeah. Yeah. You can't go there. Yeah, so definitely. It's, it's coming down on my head. Yeah. And one of the things that was quite different is that, as you mentioned, you would basically project a single frame for a very small amount of time, and then you'd move the film to the next frame, and then you'd project that, and then you'd move it to the next one. And this right. is very different from what you describe in the book and was quite a stunning thing to read, I think, which is what if we had this ideal sampling theorem based approach to projection? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So, so basically what we have what we went with was a system that projects individual frames and blackness in between right. each frame onto the human retina. Right. And the brain does figures out how to make it move. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the sampling theorem says, well, no, I mean, you should be able to sample at a twice the highest frequency in visual flow. I mean, Fourier's uh, theorem applies to visual flow like it does to everything else. It's a sum of frequencies. And you sample at twice that, you know, twice the highest frequency in a visual flow. Yeah. And you, uh, reconstruct by having several frames overlap in time and right. add back together. And you should have an ideal reconstruction of visual flow before it enters the pupil. Right. As far as I know, nobody's done that. Right. But the theory That's... just sits there and says it's got to be true. Yeah. Yeah. So the image that we would be getting, it wouldn't be these kind of snap, snap, snap. It would be this, this, you'd see a little bit of a few frames ago and a little bit of one frame ago and then the frame, and then you'd have the future frames and it would all be. Yeah. And it all adds up just according to the, it's, it's right. spreading the frame is what I call it. It's, it's like yeah. spreading the pixels in, right. in a still picture. It, it's the theory just sitting there. It's beautiful. Yeah. But to be done. Yeah. Now, another theme of your book is the interplay between engineering creativity and artistic creativity. And this is something that we see, and you alluded to it here, up in the early days of animation. And because ideal sampling wasn't occurring and because of other technical limitations, animators had to develop a visual language that is not true of reality, but was true of cartoons and created th this sort of sense of what uh, we would want to be seeing as a person. Can you tell us a bit about these techno technological workarounds that have come to really define? Yeah, it's like, one of the, it's like one of the wonders of of animation, of character yeah. animation. The great animators came up with these tricks. I mean, they weren't technical at all. They just realized that you had to you had to twiddle twiddle the pictures in order for the human brain to get the right uh, right. right information from them. So, I mean, speed lines is an easy one. If they wanted something to appear be moving fast, they would draw speed lines. Right. Well, it's just a language, right? Those speed lines were a language to the brain that says, oh, whatever else you do when you're looking at this frame, make it go fast because that's what the animator said to do. They came yeah. up with these, they had puffs, you know, poof, as yeah. the coyote jumps over the edge of the cliff. 
Yes. All these little clues that added to the information that that uh, our brains very fast, you know, 24 frames, of, well, 48 frames per second, very fast is putting this information together and uh, to give the give the feel that the animators knew had to be there. I mean, yeah. it, once I figured it out, um, you know, I met all the old time animators back at, at Disney. Yeah. Not all of them. I met uh, Frank Johnson and Ollie Johnson and Frank Thomas, just two of the greatest old men. Yeah. And uh, they, you know, they taught me about squash and stretch and anticipation and exaggeration. And then one day I got to try it and I described this in the book. You know, I'm I'm not a great animator, but I I can model things. So I modeled one in my hands with yeah. cylinders for bones and spheres for joints. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and then I since I have a computer, I just mirrored one hand to get the other hand. Right. And so I'm sitting there with two models of two hands in 3D. Yeah. Said, well, let's see. I should animate these. Yeah. Now, I must add that this is back in the bad old days when the computers are too slow really to do anything. Right. So I clap my hands. You look yeah. at that. That's that seems to be pretty easy to animate. And it is. So I did it, and it was boring. <laughs> what a boring animation. Yeah. You know. It, it, <laughs> I said, okay. Here's where Frank and Ollie come in. Yeah. They they could make that interesting. So I followed their textbook, so to speak. Right. Exaggerated this, the hands coming. I bit my hands way back and slammed them together. My, my modeled hands slammed them together. And the fingers tips pulsed out and they retracted. You know, yeah. I just made it. Oh. The result was it was really, <laughs> it was fun. Yeah. It was, you know, it was sloppy and floppy and it was fun to watch. I mean, yeah. Turns out hand clapping is not fun to watch, but you can make it fun to watch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that's one of the great things that your book highlights, which is this idea that there were these technical limitations that then required animators to work around in order to, like you say, give the brain more information than what was presentable from the medium. But then that then becomes part of the, the language and part of the art and can even be used, even if you could perfectly reconstruct the image. Um, right. And make clapping a bit more fun than it potentially is in real life. Right. Um, so many in the audience are likely familiar with another important tenet of your book, which is Moore's Law. This is the idea loosely based that the performance of computing hardware doubles every few years. How did that impact the history of the pixel? Immensely, immensely. <laughs> it's the it's the secret sauce of the modern world. Um, yeah. You know, I was born before computers, so I've watched the whole thing. Right. And in 1965, Gordon Moore announced what we call the law, Gordon Moore's law, yeah. uh, which you paraphrased there. Um, I have a different version that is a lot more intuitive right. than the version you gave, which is about density of components on a chip. Right. My intuitive version is of Moore's law is that everything good about computers gets better by an order of magnitude every five years. Right. Now, order of magnitude is fancy for factor of 10. Right. Why do I use order of magnitude instead of factor of 10? Because a factor of 10 is about as much as we puny human beings can, can conceive of. The yeah. change gets to be that big, we start kind of losing it. Yeah. And we have to come up with new conceptualizations. Moore's law says there will be one of those order of magnitude, reconceptualizations every five years. Right. And that's been true since 1965. Yeah. So if you take Moore's law factor as a one in 1965, right. when I made my first computer graphic image, by the way, it's sitting at 100 billion X right now. Right. Uh, I mean, these are silly numbers. We humans don't know what it means. <laughs> yeah. You certainly can't predict what it, back back in 1965, I might have been able to tell you that Moore's Law would be 100 billion. <laughs> I don't think I could have done it yeah. uh, now, but I couldn't have told you what it fit, was going to feel like or what it could do or what, you just, we just, we just have to get there. We right. just have to ride the wave. Uh, or another way I like to put it is, if you can 
if you could see one order of magnitude ahead, you can probably be a billionaire. Right. It's, it's, it's just, these are big, fast changes. And by the way, Moore's law is still going despite its often, <laughs> its death is often announced. Uh, 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 announced. I've, I've seen its death announced four or five times in my career. I just yeah. don't believe it anymore. The engineers basically don't know what to do with an order of magnitude change either until they get there. And then they say, oh, look what we can do now. And they yeah. push it again. So maybe, maybe we'll hit the end. I don't know. I keep seeing. You know, IBM announced a two nanometer technology a few months ago. So, right. um, so we're going to hit a trillion in just a few years. Right. Everything good about computers will be one trillion times better in uh, four years, I guess it is now. Right. Than it was in 1965. What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I can show you how, how fast the numbers, you know, how big the numbers are and how, how, how small the computers will be in and how fast they'll go. But yeah. I don't know what it feels like or, or, or what revolutions we'll be able to enable with that kind of speed. You just can't see ahead to do yeah. it, which yeah. makes our, which makes writing them Moore's law of wave, one of the great adventures of all time. And my entire life has been writing that wave. It's everybody in this audience, the same thing. And I think they'll continue to write it. Yeah. Yeah. And your book also describes this moment um, in the early days of Pixar. I guess it was maybe the mid 80s. And you were describing that as you were working towards this goal of building the first uh, 3D animated movie, there was this moment where you were almost waiting for Moore's Law to kind of get you from where you guys were to where you needed to be. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, so somewhere along the line, we kind of caught on to Moore's Law. That, yeah. Oh, well. I, so I remember in um, at a place called New York Institute of Technology on Long Island. It was sort of the first place that the group that be, finally became known as Pixar coalesced, right. uh, working for a very wealthy man on a fabulous campus. Right. Uh, and we conceived of being the first group in the world to make a digital movie there. So that was that was about 1975. Right. Uh, not really understanding it was going to take us 20 years <laughs> yeah. to, to do that. In fact, we didn't understand that at all. Um, but we could sit down and just, you know, Ed Catmull and I, who's a co-founder of Pixar with me, yeah. would sit down with a <laughs> honest to God envelope and scratch out yeah. <laughs> computations and say, well, let's see, in order to make a movie today, 1975, scribble 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 cost several billion dollars and take you know a decade it's not going to happen it's in, it's infeasible yeah well but by the same measure you can sort of say well look if we just assuming it holds right out here somewhere it's got to happen right it's let's just be ready let's have all the technologies ready and all the algorithms ready right. and uh so forth and that's what we did yeah yeah, and you also talk about, I think there was a competitor that had just purchased a Cray supercomputer, and you guys really thought that that was... Oh, we thought we had <laughs> really screwed the pooch. You know, we thought <laughs> that Yeah, <laughs> this was Gary Demos and John Whitney Jr. They were, they were, they were guys in Hollywood, right. lots of connections. Um, for example, I was, uh, Francis Ford Coppola invited me to a, to a, a big luncheon on one of his sets, where yeah. there were like 20 people around each round table and there were round tables as far as you see, could yeah. see in every direction. And at my table was Terry Garr, the movie star. Right. And right next to her was John Whitney Jr., my arch rival. And right. he and Terry Garr just hitting it off like crazy. And all of a sudden I went, oh, Jesus, they grew up together. <laughs> I mean, he's so tied into Hollywood. What chance did Ed and I have? We haven't got a chance in hell. Yeah. It, but they, then they bought that cray. It was like, what? And so and I whipped out the envelope against it. No, it doesn't make economic sense. They're gambling really big right. that everybody else in Hollywood will sign up for time on that cray. Right. We, and they did not do that. So right. <laughs> our arch yeah. rivals flamed out. Yeah. Yeah. And 
Um, one of the things that also we sort of touched on is that as hardware has advanced and become more optimized, it becomes harder and harder to maybe push the envelope from the technical side. And we kind of see this in Pixar movies today. I think it's, it's less and less obvious from subsequent movie to subsequent movie that the technology is improving the way that it was in, when those first few came out. You could really see a lot happening. How do you see that? And do you think that there are ways for people to continue to push the envelope technically, even if they're maybe a little bit more subtle? Um, I'm not sure how to answer that yeah, question, yeah. but uh, um, you know, my basic basic underlying feeling is Moore's law. You don't understand it until you get there. Right. We're we're all writing it right now by the seat of our pants, whether we understand it or not, and we're yeah. going to get to some exciting places. Will Pixar finally max out on what technological things they, they can can do? Yeah. Probably not. I mean, right. what if you can make a movie in an hour instead of three years? You know, right. What that doesn't that feel completely different? Doesn't that right. change the feel of the world? I say yes. Doesn't yeah. that make GarageBand Pixar as possible? Um, yeah. You know, you just don't know. Yeah. Uh, my, yeah that my personal take on it is I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a advisor for this uh, VR startup company in Silicon Valley called Baobab Studios. Yeah. Mostly just to, first of all, they're doing character animation, which is my first love, right. but they're doing it in VR. And uh, I'm very curious about VR and AR and MR and so forth. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> One of the things I like about it is just being surrounded by that crazy energy of an entrepreneurial enterprise, you know, right. so that you can only do, I say, when you're young, because it's so damn scary. <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> you don't know whether you're going to make it or not. I've done it <laughs> twice and I succeeded both times, but man, is it scary. <laughs> yeah. 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 And going back to the theme of this interplay between technological creativity and artistic creativity, yeah. Pixar, especially in those early days, is, is really one of the best examples of a company that has expertly melded artistic, technological, and business successes in ways that really no one else has. How were you guys thinking about that in the early days of Pixar, especially this idea of blending the engineering creativity with the artistic creativity? Well, we, we, we were thinking about it all along, and I think it's the, the, the mix of people that were Pixar. Uh, you know, I'm an artist. I started out as an artist. It turns out uh, you know, I learned how to oil paint from my uncle, George, in New Mexico, where I grew up. Uh, he let me sit on his floor in his studio as long as I didn't say a single word. And I learned how to stretch canvas and prepare brushes and mix colors and lay out paint. And I paint oil painted and acrylic painted for years. Yeah. But I was also really smart computer wise. Right. So... Along comes Xerox Park, and my buddy Dick Shout built Super Paint, and I looked at that and went, "Well, that's me, you know, that that's painting and computer, computer and computers at the same same time." So yeah. it was my future was kind of guaranteed from there on. Yeah. Uh, um, so what I'm trying to say is, I and several of the other early members of the group that became Pixar, yeah, were as artistic as they were engineering yeah. and we brought that sensibility in um, and we just so I would I would get furious if somebody looked down their noses at artists right. or vice versa so we just disallowed that we just disallowed that that's not part of our culture right. because our business required the t technically creative people and the artistically creative people right to work to I mean those are different people there's no question about it Right. But they have to work together and not just work together, but admire each other and 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 and, and assign dignity to the other. And, yeah. and, and truthfully, not not just right. not just words. You know, you, you have to you have to admire the the amazing cre technical creativity of the technical creativity of the technical people and vice versa. Right. Now I've been in places where the technoids, the so called technoids were looked down on by the by the graphic artists in the graphic arts house. That's yeah. so wrong. That is right. so wrong. 
And and um, I worked at Microsoft for a while where it was if, if you're smart, you program. Otherwise, you do right. this this artistic <laughs> stuff and marketing. Yes. <laughs> no, no, come on. It just yeah. doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys were really making this deliberate choice of, of stressing the uh, equity across these different disciplines. But then there was also the uh, maybe serendipity of the fact that you had some of the, the greatest technical minds and some of the greatest artistic minds together at the same time. Um, yeah, we had we have, you know, I call them my geniuses in the book. We just had this right. set of geniuses, technical geniuses that w is what I usually mean when I use that term. Yeah. Just just showing because they want, you know, everybody wanted to be in the movies. It was a very attractive yeah. life pursuit. Yeah. So, man, did we get some smart ones. Yes. <laughs> One of the other things that was quite compelling from the book was you talk about uh, what you call basically jam sessions, where you would have a technical person who, who really knew what the technology, the nascent technology at that point was capable of. And you had someone who was rather artistically creative and you would sort of sit together. How did those go? What were those like? Well, they were completely experimental for one thing. So yeah. you had to kind of like each other, which uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> my first experience with that was with a guy named David DeFrancisco, who's one of the original four people at the group now known as Pixar. Yeah. Uh, he was an artist, video artist, and uh, he begged his way into Xerox Park to work yeah. on the paint program. And at first I was really reluctant because a lot of artists wanted to work there, but they it wasn't clear they offered anything, right. but I, I started understanding that David was different somehow. He was, he, he loved technology as well as he loved art. And I loved art as well as I loved technology. So something was bound yeah. to happen. So yeah. I invited him down. We started these overnight jam sessions where since there was only one tablet for a paint program, we had to alternate and man, we had no idea where the paintings were going to go as we, chatted and joked and 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 futurized the night yeah. away most of it was junk just to be honest but it was <laughs> it was a lot of fun yeah and how important were things like that then in terms of developing the actual software that you would later use at pixar to make films um because obviously the artists need to be able to to do it well they the, do and get it the artists them. like the animators uh were key Key, key to um, designing the interface to the to the software. I mean, if they yeah. couldn't use it, what, what, what was it for? Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes we'd scratch our heads when they asked for certain things, but then we would do it and we'd say, oh, that's what they meant. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, and it really is this quite remarkable interplay, as we've been saying, of technical people seeing what the artists needed, what the animators needed, and the animators then being able to work within the bounds of, of what was available. <laughs> Right. Um, looking forward a bit to today, we have a lot more capabilities now than we did in those early days. And there are still um, a lot of the character animation language that we see early on still exists today. So for example, like in a movie like Finding Nemo, we could create this world where you see actual fish that look like actual fish, but we choose not to. Why is that? And can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it's interesting that you mentioned Finding Nemo in that context, because um, in Finding Nemo, uh, the artist originally created an underwater world that was as realistic, as stunning as the real underwater world is. Right. And we, we had to back it off <laughs> because right. it, it, was take, it was so gorgeous that it took attention away from our characters. Right. Which, it's the characters that matter, right? And then an character animation. Yeah. So you had to turn turn the, uh, <laughs> okay, don't make it quite so good. <laughs> yeah. Turn yeah. it down. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. And so there was this deliberate decision then that really what we want is to create this, this character driven story and the technology is a tool to get us there, but it needs to be uh, the art first. Yeah. The story, no question, and good character animation. Pixar style, it's the story that um, everything centers on. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, 
one of the most compelling parts of the book was reading about those early days at NYIT and then Pixar, where you guys were really on the cutting edge of technology and art. And it's a bit of a fool's errand to predict the future, but where would you recommend artists and technologists today go to find new creative expressions in the world of, of digital light or digital media? SIGGRAPH. So that's <laughs> been the answer for decades. Go to SIGGRAPH. Yeah. It's the big annual conference where yeah. all the people who are doing anything in the business show off to their peers. Yeah. <laughs> so at, at its height, there was something like 40,000 people a year showing up at SIGGRAPH. Wow. And it was just, you know, almost impossible to stay up with the the paper. So there are technical papers and there are artistic productions and there are right. art shows and there are kid things. And uh, I don't know, SIGGRAPH is a rich, rich environment and has been so for decades. Go to yeah. SIGGRAPH. If, if, if you want to see who is who and meet the people, that's the place. Yeah. Yeah. And it certainly features prominently in the history of, of 3D uh, animation that you that you describe. And there's a specific moment where you guys are working on a project um, that you were wanting to present at SIGGRAPH. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, you're talking about Andre and Wally B? This is, yeah. this, this is OK. So we were working for George Lucas by this time. Right. And George, he he didn't really get who we were. He thought only Disney could do animation and um uh, that we we were the you know, we were the technoids right so we we were hardware and soft we thought we had established with him that we we could produce content so um we, yeah we can do hardware and software if that's our that's how we pay pay our way right. which we did and um but we really wanted to make content and we got this we got this you know I, hired this guy john laster turns out to be one of the geniuses of, of animation right. and he um we wanted to show off that we had solved motion blur it's one of the technical hard problems so um at the 1984 sig graph we showed andre and wally b right. adventures of andre and wally b animated by john laster his first time working with the group that would become pixar with 3D characters and we had solved motion blur, so forth. So, you know, we couldn't wait to show this at SIGGRAPH. There'd be yeah. 5,000 people there, all of every one of whom would know what we had accomplished and be screaming their heads off in right. excitement. They would know what we had done. Right. And much to our surprise, George Lucas decided to attend that SIGGRAPH. <laughs> Yeah. Now, it turns out he really was in, this is Minneapolis, mm -hmm. he was really in town to see his girlfriend, Linda Runstad, perform. But he took in SIGGRAPH while he was there. And we were so excited. George yes. is going to see what it is that we do <laughs> to 5,000 screaming fans, right? Yes. Finally, he'll understand. But yeah. you know what? He didn't. I found out years later he didn't get it. Um you know, basically, he could see what he could see. And Andre and Wally Bees, if you look at it now, it's a little bit crude. Right, it was right. the first time out in this space. And fact is, it wasn't even complete. There were still some wireframes in it and stuff. Right. You know, the SIGGRAPH audience, they just filled in the blanks. They knew exactly what this all meant and yeah. that Moore's Law is going like this. And it was, this is the future. Get out of the way. But George didn't see that. He was sort of bummed out by the story and the fact that you know, it's a little bit crude and yeah. And yeah, thank God he didn't tell us. It would have broken our hearts. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's good management, knowing what not to tell. <laughs> um, and what was it about? So you talk in the book, you call the this first um, digitally animated movie, the movie in capital letters. What was it about the movie that it was on everyone's mind? It was the thing that everyone was was working towards. Why was that? Well, we. You know, the goal had been since 75 ish yeah. to be the first group in the world to make a completely digital movie. That was a, you know, simply expressed vision. We didn't know what the movie would be. We didn't know whether it'd be 2D or 3D. We didn't, we just knew it had to be completely computer generated, no, no hand drawn um, components, so forth. There are a lot of paths we could have followed it turns out the one that worked was the one that gave us toy story and uh, 
turns out it was this new way of modeling in 3D that nobody had seen before. And it just sort of flipped everybody out and has changed the whole movie making world, hasn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And so was it this alignment? Because it, it seems like some of the people that you discuss in the book, yourself and Ed Catmull, you all just kind of knew like this was the goal. Yeah. Um, I guess we must have talked about it a lot. It just, it just was always yeah. sitting there. Yeah. We, for five years, we were a hardware company because right, we right. knew Moore's Law wasn't, wasn't there yet. Um, and yeah. uh, I, in fact, we had tried to do a, a movie based on the Monkey King for a Japanese company. And when I ran the numbers, I discovered, oh, no, we can't do it for a reasonable amount of money right. and a reasonable amount of time. Morse law hasn't arrived yet. It was a real yeah. shocker. And it it informed Ed and me when we started Pixar. You can't be a movie company now, not for five more years. We need another order of magnitude. So yeah. for 10 years, I mean, five years, we were a hardware company right. of not particularly dazzling success. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. So one of the, as we are starting to wrap up here, another question I have is, your book, you are reconstructing lots of historical narratives. You're looking at a lot of different um, people and stories and who got to things first. And you're really reconstructing these complex historical narratives. And you have these very informative and beautiful flowcharts and things to help you do that. What was that like going in and, and trying to answer these specific questions of who was there first and and do all of that with these well the i was really things. surprised at how lousy the histories of technologies <laughs> have been reported i yeah. thought i would just go look it up and write it down right, right. not a, every one i looked up was wrong so, well you right. know starting with um um Katelnik, well, the sampling theorem it wasn't right. shannon whoa right right so it took me a year to straighten that out that's why it took me 10 years i had every time i got to the next Technology, right. I said, I had to find out that nobody really has it right. Isn't that weird? Movies, movies. Who yeah. invented the movies? None of the people you think did it, did it. Right. William Kennedy, Laurie Dixon, who's that? Well, he's pretty much the guy. Right. So <laughs> I've got a chapter on that. Um, I, I had a chapter on television, too, by the way. I had to take it out to make the book publishable. Right, you know, right. It's already pretty heavy. Right. Um, <laughs> um, who, who invented television? Well, really hard to answer that problem. I said, isn't it weird that here I am, Albie Ray Smith, I watched this whole thing happen in my lifetime, and I can't tell you who made the first movies, you know, had the first movie machine, who did the television first, who who did computer graphics first. Yeah. I, you know, why, why, why is this such a fuzzy that the answer's got to be out there? Right. So I just started saying, okay, it's got to be a definitional problem. So I very carefully define my right. terms. Right. And then I used, I, I have avoided the simple narrative. I think that's the killer version yeah. of history where yeah. some genius single person has this idea and from everything derives from him or her. No, it just never works that way. Hardly ever. Alan Turing, maybe in, com in computers, yes, but certainly not in the movies, not in television, not in computer graphics. And I came up with this idea of flow charts or gene genealogies of right. all the people and how they interacted, how they stabbed each other in the back, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> how they stole from each other. I mean, yeah. it's a real story. And you can see how it was all coming together, who borrowed from who, and how it finally works its way out into the modern leaves yeah. of the tree yeah and it's a much more satisfying it's like I, gee i hope people start telling these technological histories with a little more sense of truth to them than so than has been the case so far yeah yeah that's great so we have time for a few audience questions um we have a few here the first question i wanted to ask is from ed who asks how many of the wind-up toys that used to be on your office windowsill in Building C at Kerner do you still have, and how many of them ended up animated in films? <laughs> That's a good question. That's actually a question you should ask of John Lasseter. He was the guy with all the wind-up toys. Yeah. I didn't really have that many wind-up toys. But right. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, a lot of those toys didn't end up 
son's chasing me here. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, didn't end up in the movies. There are yeah. a lot of a lot of uh, in in references in the in the movies. Yeah. That were there to entertain us because some of, the, some of these things took a long time to generate, and we just wanted to keep ourselves entertained yeah. during the many many months involved. Yeah. And of sometimes tedious effort as well, it sounds like. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So the next question we have is from Mark. And we kind of touched on this already, but he says, over time, we've seen a more law-like increase in number and decrease in size of screen elements. Do you foresee a limit to these numbers, either in terms of display technology or visual acuity? Well... I, I try to be very careful about what Moore's law really applies to, and it's not it does not apply to screen elements, display elements. Uh, they 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 definitely have to have a size, uh, whereas a bit doesn't. Right. A bit is just a distinction, and there's sort of no limit on the size of a what qualifies as as a distinction. And Moore's law applies to the one particular case, integrated circuits, where that distinction, the, the amount of space it takes to represent a distinction can just keep getting smaller and smaller. Now, of course, if you get down to quarks and things like that, right. the scene changes, but we're a long ways away from that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, the next question we have is from Alonzo, who asks, what do you see as the role of AI in entertainment? Well, I'm pausing because when I came to Stanford for my PhD in 1965, Moore's Law won, by the way, Right. I came to learn this new exciting subject called artificial intelligence. Right. I just thought that was the coolest thing I had ever heard, that maybe the computer models would explain how this thing works, right. which is the most interesting question of all, isn't it? Yeah. How does this work? And uh, after two or three years of studying AI from the founders of the field, yeah. I says, you know what? I don't think this is going to happen in my lifetime. Uh, so I changed to something that I could do in my lifetime, like make the first movie. Okay. But hey, you know, I probably have another 10, 15, 20 years. Who knows? And AI is still cranking away. It's still yeah. got everybody excited. It has like a 10-year cycle. Everybody gets re-excited by AI every 10 years. And we're on this amazing. And you know what? Things are pretty interesting right now in AI. I've, yeah. I've tracked it all along. Um, this is not really an answer, but uh, my wife and I were in Cambridge, England on her sabbatical. Yeah. Uh, a couple of years ago, and one of my old pals, a fellow pixel packer, he, yeah. he wrote filters for Photoshop, approached me. He says, hey, Alvy, we don't have to program anymore. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, read this paper. And he handed me a paper that I call the the zebras and horses paper. From, actually, it's from the AI group at, at Berkeley right here. Right. And basically... A particular net, a gun, a gun, uh, had been trained with a thousand pictures of horses, just arbitrary, unlabeled, just, just okay, and a thousand pictures of zebras. And the result was, after training, that you could hand this gun a, um, an arbitrary picture, say, of horses, and it would give you back that same picture with each horse replaced with a zebra. Right. And I went, what? How does it, how does it, I said, I don't even think that's a well-posed problem. <laughs> what, I mean, what's a, what's a horse and what's a zebra, right? And uh, he says, Alvin, that's the point I'm trying to make. We don't know. And it's way too expensive to reverse engineer to figure out what that gun is doing. Right. And that's when I said, oh my goodness. It never occurred to me that when we got to how AI really works, it'd be so complex that I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> right, yeah. And maybe that's the definition is AI is, if you can understand it, then it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be intelligent <laughs> and vice versa. Yeah. So I'm watching carefully, but I've got, 
you know, I've got my skepticism flag yeah. waving a little bit too. Yeah. It, I've, I've seen the uh, marketing power of that phrase AI used many, many, many years to raise lots and lots and lots of money. So, yeah. but boy, here's some exciting stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely an interesting time. Um, so we're, that's all the time we have actually for you. Um, Dr. Smith, I want to thank you again for joining us. It has seriously been so enlightening and really exciting to get to talk with you today. Okay. Thanks everybody. I've enjoyed it too. Dr. Smith's new book, A Biography of the Pixel, is available now wherever books are sold, including through your local and independent bookseller. It's really a wonderful and it's a fascinating read and it would make an excellent holiday gift. So I really recommend people check it out. For everyone who joined us today, we look forward to seeing you at our next Talks at Google event. Please stay safe and take care.